that, that, that sermon bumper thing ends so quick. <laughs> so quick. Like, you guys get out here, right? Try to get your iPad set up, get your mic turned on, check your zipper, make sure it's up, all that stuff. <laughs> you guys try that. Try that in that short period of time. I guarantee you're always going to forget something, always. And you hope it's not the latter, right? <laughs> Okay, all right. Well, great, man. Good to have you guys here with us. For those of you who are here for the very first week, my name is Jeff, and I have the unique privilege of serving as a lead pastor. I'm just one of the pastors, though, uh, at our church. I I love our church. I think our church is an incredible church because it's you. You make up the church. It's not us as pastors. Uh, But we get the unique job of working with some, I think, of some of the most incredible people in all of South Central Nebraska, going all the way from Ogallala right now, who's worshiping with us live, to Nor Platt, who's with us live, to everybody who's in their pajamas at home right now. I hope you enjoyed that first song, but there was nothing like being here for it, right, guys? I mean, yeah, I mean, it was awesome. It was awesome. Uh, I was talking in the green room right before I got here, and I said, look, man, The church has showed up today, and they are ready, and they are hungry for God. And I appreciate the fact you didn't show up today with this attitude, like, will you guys convince me one more week to to worship God? Instead, you showed up, and you were like, I am ready to go after Jesus. And I want to say thank you guys for doing that. Some of you, you might be here for the first time. You may not even have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to know that one of our guarantees at New Life is that we love people right where they are, okay, But watch this, we love you enough not to leave you where we found you. Which means this, that today, this message is going to challenge every one of us. It's going to challenge you, who I just refer to as seekers of God, but you're just like early on, right, in your your seeking of God. You've yet to really surrender surrender your life to Christ. And today's message is also going to challenge those of you who, I would just say it this way, who you consider yourself to be mature in the faith. Some, most people that consider themselves to be mature in the faith are not. And normally it's the ones who are the humble that we're pointing out, we're going, man, I love your faith and I would love to walk in the same shoes that you walk in. But today's message is one that's going to, it encompasses all of those stages of your spiritual growth, which by the way, is what my goal and our agenda is at New Life every single week. That's why we put together things in a teaching series so that we, we take God's word we package it together in kind of a, a focal thought, and then we say it's going to be X amount of weeks. We do that for a few reasons. One, the Bible is massive, and it, and it takes our entire life to study. And we're never going to gain all of its truth, and I praise the Lord for that, um, in one lifetime. Nor will you gain all of its truth in multiple lifetimes. Okay? Because... God says, I'm new every morning. He's making himself new. He's not changing his word. It's that through the anointing of his Holy Spirit, he points things out to you that you never saw before. That's going to happen for your life today, and I'm excited for that. But we also preach in a teaching series because we recognize that there's always new people being added to the church at New Life. It's amazing. With three different campuses and online Every single Sunday, there's somebody that's new with us that wasn't here the week before. And you might be that person. And normally, people like to get in on the beginning of things. So when you teach in a series, it allows you to like go, hey, we only have one week left, which this is the last week of Doomsday Prepper, by the way. But we're getting ready to start a new series next week. So if you're new here, come back next week. You get to start something new with all of us. None of us have ever been there before. We're all starting on the same page. So it doesn't matter whether you've been around this church for 30 years or you've been around this church for three days. We're all starting in the same place. That makes it comfortable for all of us. So welcome to New Life. Glad to have you here. Doomsday Prepper. That's a weird name for a title. No, we're not teaching you how to have a prepper bag to prepare for a doomsday in a physical sense. But we are pointing out the fact that the Bible speaks about the end of times, and a doomsday that is coming, if you can put it that way. There is both the the rapture of the church, which is a day of hope, to be with Christ and meet him in the air, and to spend eternity with him in heaven, true. But after that, the Bible talks about a doomsday that I don't know about you, I don't want to live through that doomsday. And if there is anything in the heart of God that would allow us 
to not live through that, which I believe is the heart of God, because the wrath of God is going to be poured out on earth during the, what's called the tribulation period. And I just happen to believe that the wrath of God is reserved for those who have chosen not to follow him. So what does it look like to be prepped and ready so that when Jesus comes and the trumpet sounds, we go and we meet him in the air? And what does it look like to overcome the enemy in these last days? Because let me just tell you this. This pastor that you're, talk, that you're listening to right now is not about an escape method off this earth. I will live three lifetimes on this earth if God allowed me to, to accomplish his mission. And I just want to bring a little conviction to some of you. Some of you want to escape this earth a little too much. And that's the wrong attitude. You'll never maximize your life for God's kingdom if your heart is always to escape from this earth. It's good to be looking forward towards heaven. It's not good to be looking over this life to heaven. This is the life God gave us. He gave me breath to preach a message. He gave me breath to live a life. He gave me breath to live for today. And if he chooses to give me breath for tomorrow, it's not for my selfishness. It's so that the world might know one more person might know that God loves them, he's got an incredible plan for their life, and he, and he saved them by his death and resurrection from the cross. Guys, that's our mission. My mission is not to escape this earth. My mission is to live today for the king. And then one day he calls me home. The byproduct of living for Jesus today is that one day he calls me home. That's the byproduct. Now, do I have hope for that? Yes, I do. Am I going to make sure that I'm prepared for that? You better believe it. But I'm hungry to live for Jesus today. Guys, that's where our hunger ought to be. So if that's who you are, Doomsday Prepper is definitely for you. Because the theme verse is all about how do you overcome in this world today. Right? That's the whole, po that's the whole focus of it. How do you overcome today? Revelation Chapter 12, verse 11 is our theme verse. Would you read this with me? And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to what? To death. This is our theme verse. This verse that we've been looking at the entire series is really about people who become followers of Jesus during the doomsday. That's what this verse is really about. People that decide in the midst of a tribulation period of time, seven years the Bible talks about, they decided, I'm going to follow Jesus. All the way to the point where they gave up their lives. That's what this is really talking about. But the principles found in this apply to us today. The principles are what help us become these overcomers today. And that's really why we're focused on this verse. Because we will face all kinds of challenges and difficulties in these days, these last days. In fact, um, the Apostle Paul was even talking about some of these in Romans chapter 8. When, when he said these words, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Right? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? Or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Basically he's saying this, you will face these things. These will be things that you face in the last days. Don't be confused by them. Don't think that God's abandoned you in these last days. You will be an overcomer. He goes, no. No, it does not mean that God doesn't love us. He goes, no. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Which means this, at the beginning of this message, I want you to know that the whole focus of the message is to encourage you that you are an overcomer. Not to discourage you with the fact that we're going to face difficulties, but to encourage you that in Christ you are an overcomer and that we can, we can see overwhelming victory. Who wants to see overwhelming victory in their life? Right. That's what I'm saying. That's the good news. So to get there, then what does it look like to be an overcomer in these last days? Well, we have to live like these believers who are coming in the future. We have to live like them. Today, we have, to, we have to live our lives the same way. And here's one of the ways they lived their lives. That they did not love their life to the death. That doesn't sound super encouraging, I know. But it makes me think of great moments in history. Like the formation of our nation. 
okay? The formation of our nation had a bunch of people that did not love their life even unto death. And one of them was a new and upcoming star in the movement. His name was Nathan Hale. Nathan Hale, at 21 years old, gave up his life for our country on September 22nd, 1776. A few months earlier in July, Nathan Hale decided he was going to join the military and he was going to fight against the Brits who were trying to now take us over again. In July, he went underneath the command of General George Washington. How cool would that have been? Right? And while serving there from July, he starts doing, you know, the military work and he's very good at it and he starts quickly getting promoted and uh, the general comes and he says, look guys, I need a spy. We got to send some spies behind the enemy lines to discover a few things. I need some volunteers. And Nathan Hale's hand immediately went up. He goes, I'll, I'll go surf. I'll, I'll take on that dangerous mission. If it's for the sake of our country, I'll take it on. And he took it on. The one week after being behind the enemy lines, about the time he was supposed to report back with all the information that he had, he was captured and he was caught. And they found the logs where he had been taking their notes. And they, they you know, accused him of being a spy. And they were going to hang him on September the 22nd of 1776. And before they hang him, they say, do you have any final last words? And here's his final last words. He says this, I regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. I regret that. I wish I had multiple lives to give for my country. Nathan Hale became an incredible example of the sacrifice it took for America to even be established today. It's one of the reasons why I love our country. Because men and women are still sacrificing their lives for the freedoms that you and me you know, get to, get to walk around in. And if, that's, and if you're one of those who served, I just want to say thank you so much for serving so that we might have the freedom and the liberty that we experience today. Yeah. But Nathan Hale became an example for all Christians because the statement that he made and the life that he lived is the exact same thing that God's asking out of you and me to this very day. Will we live our lives in such a way that we don't love it even unto death? See, the problem in America and the problem with our world today is that we've exchanged comfort for godly desire. And we like self-pleasure more than we like self-sacrifice for God's agenda. Right? And we, we, we like large bank accounts more than we like building up a treasure in heaven. And we've exchanged the American dream for God's dream. And we're trying to extend the very days of our life on this earth for the pleasure of self rather than losing our life on this earth for the cause of Jesus Christ. It's one thing to live healthy. Live healthy, please. Do whatever you can do to live healthy. Do whatever you can do to maximize the life that God gave you because he's the one who's giving you breath. I guarantee you, he's going, you better maximize it. Do everything you can. But there's a difference between living healthy and loving this life. And this increasing desire to try to outlive death is more prevalent today than it's ever been before. Scientists actually believe that there will be one day that they will unlock your genetic code and cause you to be able to outlive death itself. And those who, who have died before that, who believe it, they're, ta they're taking the science fiction road and they're having their bodies, you know, cryogenically frozen, waiting for that development of that science fiction to come. And there are others that are hoping that one day that they're even their self-conscious will be able to be uploaded into the cloud and then be downloaded into some kind of AI device and they will outlive everything else. Craziness. And if you believe that, I want to talk to you. Because I've got a few investments that you might want to be a part of. Instead of wasting your money that way. I got something called the Kingdom Builder Fund. It's making a difference for people. It's actually causing people to find Jesus and seeing their lives change. But here's what Jesus had to say about the whole topic. He said in Matthew 16, he goes, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, then you save it. He says this, if your attention, if your intention, if your attention on this earth is to preserve your life and your purpose, then you will lose it both here and in the life to come, which is really where he was focused. But he goes, look, if your attention is on your life serving my mission, God's mission, and God's purpose, then you will save your life 
on this earth. No, no, no. It does not mean that you won't face death, maybe. But you will save your life on this earth because you've invested it into the right place. Into the cause of Jesus Christ so that in the life to come, you will spend eternity with him. Guys, the way of God's kingdom is backwards to the way of man's kingdom. And don't, it, it, too many of us, we try, to, we try to rationalize it into man's kingdom's ideas. Guys, man's ideas are in opposition to God's ideas. God's kingdom is backwards. He goes, look, lose your life for my sake, then you gain it. That's just the opposite of what we would think. We would think just the opposite, and that's where our world's at, and that's the danger of what we're living in right now. So look, don't feel bad right now. Don't get bitter right now. Don't feel defeated right now if you're going, doggone it, man, I am living for self. Don't, don't get bitter right now if you feel like, you know, you're being convicted and you're going, man, he's speaking right to me. I don't want to listen to another one of these messages. How do I get out of this place? I'm stuck in the middle of a row. Coronavirus. If you want out of here, just start coughing. <laughs> cough and walk. Cough and walk. And people are going to, they're going to give you all kinds of space. And don't do this. Just start coughing and walking. You'll get yourself right out of here. You'll be fine. You can't do that as easy in your living room. See? There's benefits to being here. Oh, but that's true. You can't hit pause. Don't do it. I pray that the batteries in your remote go out. But what you should do right now is listen. Listen to God's instruction. Because that's what he's going to give you over the next few minutes. Listen for his instruction. Listen for the one thing God's trying to speak to your life. Right? And then follow it. It's not what I'm going to say. It's what God's going to want to say to you. So let's talk about that. So for us to give up our life, like Jesus was saying, for us to be overcomers, like our theme verse says, overcome the enemy in these last days, then we have to apply this command of Jesus to our lives. Here's his command. This is what we're going to apply to our lives so that we can give up our lives and we can become overcomers of the enemy in these last days. Then Jesus told his disciples, if you would come after me, that's the command, if you would come after me, Here's three things you got to focus on. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Those three things in that order are what Jesus says to us. This is how you give up your life. This is how you become an overcomer where you don't love your life even unto death. So first, deny yourself. Let's talk about that for a moment. No one likes the word no. You don't like it. And you don't like to tell yourself no. Just think about the three-year-old that's closest to you. Your own three-year-old, and we're praying for you if you have one. A grandchild that's a three-year-old, which that's awesome, because you just fill them with sugar and off they go. Right? The three-year-old down the street, think of a three-year-old and think about telling a three-year-old, no. What kind of response do you get? It's not pretty, is it? And it, that's very much the way we look, by the way. We don't look much different than that. We don't like to tell ourselves no. But without a strong no in our lives, without denying ourselves, it's impossible to please God. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said about that in Philippians 3. He says, everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. What does he say? I've said no. I've denied myself. So that I could do something. What is it that he wanted to gain? He wanted to gain Christ. That's what he was for searching for. It's easier to say no. Let's take his example for a moment. It's easier to say no when you've got a clear target of what you're trying to search after. What your goal is. What you're trying to achieve. This is what our goal ought to be. And notice how he, he takes it from being religious and he turns it into relationship. His defined goal and what he's trying to get at and what makes it easy for him to say no is that he's got a goal, to know Christ Jesus is Lord. Personal. Personal. Not, not to have knowledge about him, but to know him in a one-on-one -on -one kind of a way and to gain Christ in a one-on-one -on -one kind of a way. When you have a clear target and you know what you're searching after, 
and you know what you're living for, then it makes it a lot easier to say no. Because in reality, what you're doing is this. In denying yourself, you're saying yes to the target. You're saying yes to what you're searching after. Denying yourself is more about saying yes than it is about saying no is what I'm trying to say. And you might go, well, that doesn't make much sense. I know, but think about it like a, like a great athlete or a, or a thriving student, a college student. Any college students in the house right now? Right on. Awesome. I love that. That was a long woo. Like, it, it was even pitchy. Like, it changed. It was almost like a song woo. I like that. You have energy right now, right? I asked that, like, towards the end of a semester, and they're like, whew. Right? So, yeah, you still have energy. So let's just think of it. A great athlete, a thriving, you know, student, or an entrepreneur. This is, what I, this is the way I want you to think about it. They all have a number of things in common, but one of the things they have in common is that when they say no to distractions or distractors, they see it as saying yes to what their goal is. They've, they've flipped the switch. They, they've changed a the gear. They made it less about what they can't do, and they made it more about what they're trying to achieve. And that's how they decide to make decisions. And I'm afraid that that's not the way it's being played out in Christianity most of the time. And the devil is really lying to us, and he defeats us because we didn't say no enough. Instead of being encouraged by the Holy Spirit for what you said yes to. So think about that athlete, that student, that entrepreneur, right? When they say, no, I'm not going to stay up late what they're saying is this, because I want to be my best in the morning. It's because I want to be my best in the morning that I say no to distractors. It's what they're saying yes to. Think about the athlete. No, I'm not going to eat all the junk food. This one I need. I need to follow this one a little bit better. Why? Because I want to achieve my fitness goal. Boom, there's my problem. I don't have a fitness goal. And if I don't have a fitness goal, I don't have a target. I got nothing to say yes to. So everything about fitness for me is about what I'm going to say no to. How defeating is it over time when your whole answer about fitness is no, 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 versus yes, 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 yes. And that's the way it's going to feel in your walk with Christ. If your walk with Christ is all about no, 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 it's going to feel defeating versus the yes, 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 yes. Think about the entrepreneur. No, no, I'm not going to overspend and go into debt. Why? Because I have a goal that I want this quarter to be a strong financial quarter. And so I make certain financial decisions because I have a target and I have a goal. To live joyfully for Jesus is more about your yes than it is your no today. Do you have a target like Paul had? To know Christ. To gain Christ. Because, guys, if you don't have a clear understanding of the target that you're living your life for, your whole journey with Jesus is about what you say no to. That will defeat you. No one, nobody in this room listening to me, standing on this platform today, no one has a strong enough and consistent, consistent enough no. None of us do. If you try to take that approach to be an overcomer, you will fail at it every single time. So what we must clearly do is this, define the target, define Jesus, like Paul did, okay, get that very clear for yourself, then let your yes drive your decision making. Now that's super practical. When I started out that point about deny yourself, you were like, that's not going to be very encouraging. But I'm telling you, don't mock my words today, I'm, I'm telling you, don't just wash them away don't just don't just go oh that's just a nice little talk i'm telling you you got to flip a switch and the enemy is going to do everything he can to keep you from flipping that switch to start seeing what you're saying yes to that's why we, we get we stay away from distractors the, the enemy wants to get your life on all the no's that decisions you have to make you'll never be an overcomer if that's where you live but if you want to live like the believers who are coming in our future and you want to overcome the enemy in today then you also have to do what Jesus said, which is take up your cross. How many of you guys have ever heard that statement in church before? i got to take up my cross. Let me see your hands. That's exactly what I thought. You've heard it a lot. So my challenge to you in the next few moments is this. Don't let this message grow mundane. Let me tell you a little bit about what it means to pick up your cross. Take up your cross. 
Taking up your cross was a, would have been something for the people who were standing there that day listening to Jesus. They would have known exactly what he meant because they would have seen people take up their cross. The horizontal bar of the cross, they would have seen them wear across their shoulders as they would have, the Romans would have marched them through the streets because they used the cross to execute criminals. And they made the criminal carry the horizontal bar of the cross through the town just to make sure that everybody understood that the Romans are here, the Romans are in charge, and your goal in life is to submit to our authority. So they marched them with this horizontal bar across their shoulders to make a bold statement symbolically to all of civilization. Submit to our authority or else. And when Jesus makes the statement, take up your cross, Jesus is driving home something that's anti our humanity. It is pro the enemy, but it's anti our humanity. And it's again one of those statements that is God's kingdom is opposite of man's kingdom. Jesus is saying, take up your cross, submit to my authority. Take up your cross, submit to my authority. Guys, it's the only way that you can really learn how to give up your life or to live your life in such a way that you're not even afraid to lose it as unto death. Listen to the way Paul, the Apostle Paul again, when he writes to the church in Galatia, how he writes to them about the understanding of what it means practically to take up your cross. He says these words. He says, my old self has been what? Crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul drives it home. He goes, look, let me just show you what it looks like to take up your cross, to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. Here's what it looks like. Let your old self be crucified. Let it die completely. Let Jesus have access to all of the thoughts that go anti, go against his word. Let Jesus have access to all of the sin nature in us and sin by sin, let him conquer it piece by piece, day by day, minute by minute, moment by moment, he says. All the way to the point where you say this, yeah, hey, look, I'm living on this earth. I'm in this earthly body and I'm doing it. How am I overcoming it? By trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I recognize that it's not by works that any great thing has happened in my life. The only way I overcome the enemy tomorrow is because the, because the Son of God, Jesus Christ, he overcame this world and he gave his life on the cross and he set me free. And every day he wakes up and he goes, I'm submitting to that truth. I'm taking up my cross. Jesus, you're my Lord. Jesus, you're my leader. Your, your opinion matters more. Your rule matters more. Your leadership matters more. That's what it looks like to take on the authority of Jesus Christ. But all too often, it's our opinion that matters most, our rule that we're going to follow. We become our own leader. And when you're doing that, you're not taking up the cross. You'll never be an overcomer unless we learn to submit to the authority of Jesus by taking on the cross and going, I am his follower, like he is mine. We live in a world of misplaced authority, don't we? And it's warping our view of God, by the way. We live in a world right now where, in these last days, the, the respect for authority, the submitting to authority is eroding all around us. Kids aren't submitting to the authority of parents. Kids refusing to submit to the authority of teachers. Men and women not submitting to the authority of the government. Yeah, and I know, like you're like, well, what if they're wicked? Well, read the Bible and see what God says about it. We, as people, not even submitting to the authority of law enforcement. There is a lack of authority, a breakdown of authority. And at the root of it all is this. When Christians stop respecting the authority of God's word, and when we stop respecting the authority of Jesus Christ himself, that's a breakdown of Christianity. And we, we tend to do these things, like we, we tend to take God's commands and make them suggestions. That's a lack of authority. Well, I, he doesn't really mean this, does he? Like he, he, won't, 
it doesn't, can he really mean what he said? I mean, we take God's commands and we break them down to suggestions. And we've, we've taken submission to the cross and we've turned it into a tamed religious symbol that hangs around our neck. Guys, when we do that, inadvertently, we're diminishing the authority of Christ. We will never be an overcomer in these last days if we diminish the authority of Christ. Take up the cross. I submit to you, Jesus. You are my leader and my Lord. Daily. So guys, we got to get back. How do you do it? you got to get back to humbling ourselves before a mighty God. We don't humble ourselves before a mighty God enough. Like even at this moment, you're in the presence of the almighty God. What should our, what should our posture be? To humble ourselves. To humble, that doesn't mean that you have to kneel down on two knees. It's an attitude of the heart. Are we humbled before the Holy Spirit right now as we listen to his teaching from his word today? Are we humble before him going, show me your truth today that I might walk out of this blindness that I'm living in. Show me this truth today that my relationship with you, Jesus, would come alive again. Seek the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We live in a really loud world. But if you want to get back to living underneath the authority, uh, the spiritual authority of Jesus Christ, then we've got to get back to a hunger saying, the Holy Spirit, come speak to me, convict me, and I want to follow that. So surrendering to the authority of Jesus Christ as leader and Lord on a daily basis, we got to get back to that. If we're going to be overcomers, lastly, Jesus said this, here's what you have to do, you got to follow me. And that might seem to you like it's just common sense. But Jesus was not saying, hey, get behind me and let's make one long line and just walk where I walk, step in my footsteps, and let me do all the work and you just follow behind me. That's, I think, sometimes the picture of people following Jesus. Like, I'm just blindly, I'm just blindly walking. And yes, Jesus wants faith, blind faith, that says he is King of kings and Lord of lords. But he wants us to be doing the work of the ministry with him. So you could interpret, follow me as imitate me. That's what he's really driving home. He's really driving home that imitate me right now. Do the things that I'm doing. Follow me, basically, like come alongside me. Right? You're the leader, Jesus, so I'll step one step behind, but I'm going to be right here on your right side. You're right there, you take a step, I'm taking a step. But I'm taking on the enemy in your name. I'm not just standing behind you. Like, he wants us all like, arm in arm with him, marching forward, overcoming the enemy in these last days. Imitate me. It's exactly what Paul said. Look what he said to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Basically what Paul says is this, be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ. Have you guys ever found yourself doing something, saying something, behaving like your parents did when you told yourself, I'll never be like my parents? Because we all said that at some point in our life. But then all of a sudden as we got older, right, it could be in our teen years, it could be in our 20s, it could be in our 30s, it could be in your 50s, and all of a sudden you turn around and you're like, holy cow, I'm just like my parents. <laughs> like someone goes, yeah, that thing that you just said, that body action, the thing that you just did, the way that you moved your face, that's exactly like the way your dad did. And you're like, no! It's, I didn't want to be that way. And we joke about it. Right? But you guys do realize that imitating, imitating something of our parents, not always, but a lot of times, it's, it's just a form of honor. I honor them. If I, if I do anything like my mom or my dad, I'm a better person for it. Because of my mom and my dad. Now, it may not be the same case for you. But I praise God for the fact that if I were to imitate something of my dad or my mom, you would, be, you would go, that's good. You should do that more, Jeff. Right? And I'm blessed with that. You may not be, but I am honoring those. At this church, New Life, you may have joined, you may, be, you may have, like, joined this church in the last seven years. If you did, <clears throat> then you missed out on the past leadership of our church, Bob and Connie Wine, right? They led our church for like 34 years. They still attend here. They're here in the first service at the Carney campus. I love the fact that they're still here, all right? But look, there's still people imitating the ministry of Bob Wine. 
There's still people saying the things that he says because I hear it all the time. And no, it's not, well, pin a rose on your nose. <laughs> I don't hear that very often because nobody knows what that means. But I do hear people imitating him very much like Paul said, imitate me, right, as I follow Christ. When they say this, well, what does your spirit say? If you've ever heard someone at this church go, well, what does your spirit say? I want you to know that we're imitating leaders that have gone before us as they are trying to imitate Christ for us. That is honoring. Follow me. Imitate me, Jesus is saying. If you want to overcome the enemy in these last days, you've got to look at the model of Jesus Christ and then live our lives more closely to that model than we ever have before. I must decrease and he must increase. That should be part of the motto of your life today. If you don't have anything to take away, you're at the end of this message and you're like, well, man, I haven't really felt like the Holy Spirit said anything to me today, Jeff. Well, number one, go back. You can listen to the message again at mynewlifechurch.com. But if you don't take anything away, take that away. I must decrease so that he must increase. Why? So that we can ultimately win. Now, if you've been paying attention, we've been looking at Jesus' command out of Matthew chapter 16. I want you to see the very last verse and this thought that he had for us when he said these words. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but you lose your own soul. Is anything worth more than your soul? They overcame because they did not love their life even unto death. You can gain everything you want in this world. And in the end, lose your whole life. Not for the cause of Christ, but lose it for eternity. It will gain you nothing to search after and to hunger for the things of this world only. Instead of living your life searching after and hungering after the things of Christ. Because in the end, your soul is what's hanging in the balance. And he's driving home the point here. Is anything worth more than your soul? No. So with everything inside of you, let's learn what it means to give up our life for his cause. And let's learn what it means to follow the examples of believers that are coming in the future, that we would live the example today that we would not love our lives even unto death, right? That we will deny ourselves, that we will take up our cross, and that we will follow Jesus. And with that attitude, let's move right into a moment of responding to God through worship, yes, but responding to God and come to him in a humble sense with what you, you, he's been putting on your heart and bring your life before him. And go, Jesus, help me to be an overcomer in these last days. I love my life a little too much. Help me to love you more. Help me to have a passion for you. That's your goal today. Your goal is to see passion for Jesus increase. That I might know Christ. That I might gain him. That he might become a clear target for me to search after and hunt after. Let's say yes to Jesus today. Won't you stand with me? So Lord, here at New Life, we're thankful that we are overcomers because of what you've done. And if it wasn't for what you did, we could never overcome. I mean, we could never even dream of overcoming. It would just be a fantasy. But you've overcome the world. You've overcome the enemy already. You've already won the battle. Now it's just a matter of us walking in lockstep with you. Like obeying you. Loving you. Letting passion increase. So Lord, I, I just pray today in Jesus' name that at New Life Church, at all of our campuses, people in hundreds of campuses in their homes right now, that Lord, there would be the conviction of the Holy Spirit that would fall upon us and a hunger and a thirst for Jesus would increase within us. Lord, if that doesn't happen, we're going to love this life way too much. Jesus, may you increase in me and may I decrease today. May you become a clear target that I hunt after and I search after and I live my life for. So we say yes to you today, Jesus. We say yes to worshiping you. We say yes to surrendering to you. We say yes. We will deny ourselves so that we can gain Christ. We say yes to you today. 
In Jesus' name, amen.